Everyone's got their own weaknesses when it comes to anime. Themes, aesthetics, and modes of action that, when you see them done well, circumvent your critical defenses and get you instantly hyped beyond words for a new potential favorite. Decadence hit my weak spot hard from the word go with a devastating combo of bouncy, expressive, expertly directed animation, naturalistic world building fueled by detailed industrial background art and mechanical design, and that soundtrack like... Dude! Masahiro Tokuda is better known for his J-drama OSTs, but he needs more anime work stat. That first episode hit me with such force that as soon as it wrapped, it became the first entry for the summer 2020 ones to watch, and while most of what I wrote that day can be heard in that video, I did have to rework my concluding paragraph after seeing more of the series. The original read as follows. I won't pretend decadence is perfect. There are a lot of cliché, by-the-numbers plot elements at play already, and it's not hard to guess what cards the series is holding on to based on what it's already laid on the table, barring any surprise trips to space anyway. But given the choice, I'll take a smooth, comfy, well-planned journey through familiar territory over a rocky road to parts unknown, and with immersive world-building, imaginative, well-executed action, and conventional but immensely likable characters, decadence seems to promise just that. <laughs> you serious? Now, if you've watched the series like I told you to, then you'll already know why all of that is hilarious. If you haven't, though, either because my seasonal recommendation didn't convince you or because it got demonetized and never popped up in your YouTube feed in the first place, well, part of the reason this video exists is to convince more people to check out this awesome, awesome anime. So I guess I should explain a bit about it and the non-spoilery parts of its basic setting before I get into the surprise that blew every one of my expectations away. Decadence is the name of a massive mobile fortress that protects the last vestiges of humanity from the Gadol, strange alien monsters with fuel for blood that attacked out of the blue one day, wiping out most of Earth's population in the process. The fortress is operated by the Gears, an advanced warrior race who defend humanity from the Gadol onslaught, asking only for total obedience and quiet servitude from the human tankers, so-called because they live in Decadence's fuel tank in return. Some particularly talented and brave tankers are allowed to fight alongside the Gears. Our plucky, enthusiastic young shonen heroine Natsume is the daughter of one such man who was killed in a Gadol attack that also took her arm. She dreams of becoming a warrior like her dear old dad and ending the fight with the Gadol once and for all, but as an amputee with a clunky prosthetic, she has a hard time convincing the powers that be of her fighting potential. Instead of joining the fight, she ends up being assigned to cleaning and armor repair duty on the outside of the fortress. Boring work to be sure, but at least the view is nice and she has good company in her gruff old boss, Kabaragi, who takes a shine to her and her infectiously upbeat attitude after a lot of pestering. <laughs> And Kabaragi turns out to be a very good friend to have when a freak accident sends them spilling over the side of the fortress and into a battle with the Gadol. Turns out the gruff old man who doesn't talk much has a past. What a twist. And his apparent experience as a soldier allows him to expertly weave through the anti-gravity field generated by the monsters, delivering killing blow after killing blow with a gun that launches these badass, blood-sucking spike things into them. It's super cool. Basically, it's Darling and the Franks meets Snowpiercer, but with the action of Attack on Titan. And coming from the studio that made Tanya the Evil and the director of Mob Psycho 100, you better believe that high-flying acrobatic combat looks incredible. But so does everything else in the show, really, from the creatures to the characters to the machinery, and especially the environments. It has been a long-ass time since I watched an anime that feels this lived in. 
As a massive world building geek, I will gladly eat up a predictable plotline if it means I get to briefly inhabit the kind of rich, vivid setting that Yuzuru Tachikawa and his team at Studio Nut have realized here. And I'm a particularly big sucker for anime that are willing to devote serious screen time to mundane daily life and unglamorous work in their fantastical settings, something screenwriter Hiroshi Seko also seems to place a lot of value on, judging from his previous works. Of course, from my perspective, the most important show on his resume is also Mob Psycho 100. Words can't fully convey how exciting it is to see the writer and director of my favorite anime ever teaming up to make something original with such a cool concept. And it's especially cool that, at the same time, Tachikawa is reuniting with Shinichi Kurita, the character designer and animation director behind his first original anime, Death Parade. So. Yeah, knowing the pedigree behind this show and having loved the first episode, I was confident that it would be a fun ride, but I was equally and wrongly confident that I knew where that ride was going from the clues dropped in episode one and the aforementioned similarities to other media. Given the existence of Pipe, a friendly, impossibly adorable Gadol specimen who Kaburagi has taken in as a pet and who I would die for, plus the Haybot-like alien things that are shown to be monitoring the battle against them at the very end of the episode, I was anticipating a slow build-up to a big twist that the Gadol aren't so bad after all, and humanity's real enemy are the shadowy puppet masters pitting us against them. What I wasn't anticipating, like at all, was that the show would pivot to the perspective of those shadowy puppet masters in space, surprise, and lay bare the entire secret conspiracy that Natsume's dad was on the verge of uncovering before his untimely death in the second episode. And I definitely didn't anticipate that such crucial exposition would come in the form of a commercial. For you see, the real reason that Natsume's world feels like a derivative hodgepodge of cliched science fiction tropes is that it is that thing. Decadence is, in actuality, the handcrafted setting of an elaborate online game run by the Solid Quake Mega Corporation for the benefit of its cyborg workforce. Not a video game, mind you, but rather an action theme park thing that spans the entire Eurasian continent, where players pilot bioengineered avatars in thrilling aerial combat against bioengineered monsters with unique strengths and weaknesses and distinctive, easily readable designs. Think Monster Hunter meets James Cameron's Avatar meets Westworld, only the robots are the players and the NPCs are real-ass human beings trapped in a fake-ass apocalyptic hellscape that was painstakingly crafted on top of what used to be their civilization. It's one of those profoundly fucked up concepts that only gets scarier the harder you think about it, and it's just the starting point of what's revealed in the episode. Solid Quake's Society of Cyborgs is every bit as horrifying as the mobilized, mechanized human zoo that is its chief source of entertainment. The sole purpose of every one of its inhabitants is to obey and serve the system until they are scrapped by the corporation that owns them at a predetermined date. Or sooner, if they step out of line and are deemed by the system to be bugs. While the aggressively cute and colorful aesthetic of this capitalist dystopia makes it simpler to draw, it's no less fascinating or complexly realized than the more conventional sci-fi setting the series leads with. The cyborgs are fully fleshed out characters, minus the flesh of course, with their own values, ambitions, insecurities, and hopes that the system invariably crushes, and while it's a very different flavor of world, I've enjoyed the time the series has let me spend there just as much as I have my time amid the industrial decay of decadence. We get to see the system through the eyes of Kabaragi, whose tragic backstory is actually that he was a pro gamer. As rankers, he and his friends once enjoyed an uncommon degree of freedom and fame for cyborgs, living in luxury as payment for mollifying the masses with their entertaining shows of skill. But when he chose to help a young up-and-comer cheat by lifting the sensory limiter between his brain and his avatar, the system decided to shut the whole ranker program down. 
and Kaburagi was sent to work in Decadence, repairing armor by day and processing human bugs by night. Yeah, while they have no awareness of it, the tankers are controlled just as strictly by the system as the gears are, implanted at birth with chips that monitor their every move and terminate them with extreme prejudice should they do anything to threaten its stability, including, especially, learning anything about the system. And Kabaragi's job is to extract the chips from their corpses. It's an unpleasant gig made all the harder by the fact that his day job puts him in regular close contact with the humans who were so comfortably distant when he was a player. It's no small wonder, then, that he finds the work to be draining and is planning to kill himself by depriving his body of precious oxyone fuel until he finds something new to live for in Natsume's dream of fighting the Gadol. Though he's not fully able to immerse himself in playing the role of her human mentor, either. Decadence's layered world-building doesn't just provide a convenient, in-narrative cover for the cliched elements of its Earth-based setting and storyline, it makes the those elements feel truly fresh, even as they're being played straight, by casting them in a new light. The way Natsume struggles against her own physical limitations and the greater limits of the harsh world she's trapped in feels distinctly reminiscent of Aaron Yeager's early character arc, right down to a training montage episode where she's unfortunately handicapped as she tries to learn the ropes of her not a jetpack thing. And with her upbeat shonen protagonist attitude, seeing her go through those motions does feel similarly inspiring, but at the same time it's undercut by a powerful and inescapable sense of dramatic irony. We as an audience, and Kaburagi as a character, know that Natsume's ambitions are inherently impossible to fulfill. She has no hope of driving off the Gadol threat for good or even reaching an understanding with humanity's ancient foe because the Gadol are just infinitely respawning video game enemies. All of the suffering that she and her people have been subjected to for centuries on end is just vaguely ham-fisted lore designed to make killing those enemies more fun and immersive for the game's customers. And the human soldiers she eventually joins up with? Well, they're just friendly combat NPCs, there to help the players out and, more importantly, to die dramatically in front of them as part of some scenario designer's plan to raise the stakes and cement the impression of a desperate fight against impossible odds. Countless brave lives sacrificed on the altar of user engagement metrics. And possibly, if you want to take the cynicism to the next level, to reinforce a pro-system cultural narrative in the game, that those who reach beyond their designated roles, like the tankers who think they can do the work of Gears, are foolhardy and ultimately doomed to meet an early grave. Natsume, her friends, her lost family, her creepy co-worker, her bullies from school, and even her impossibly cool and hot warrior Gyaru senpai Kurenai, who I want to step on me, are all all just disposable cogs in a giant machine, and not even the one they think they're cogs in. That's just a set piece, albeit a very cool one with the approximate striking power of a Saitama normal punch. The true scope of the cage that binds humanity stretches well beyond their wildest imaginings, let alone their capacity to meaningfully change it. And yet, Something in me, and in Kaburagi, wants to believe in Natsume. She may be grossly underestimating the scale of the problem she's taking on, but as the show's demonstrated in basically every episode so far, everyone else is perpetually underestimating her. And she is an unswervingly ganky, constantly growing shonen action hero, after all. Is it not baked into the very DNA of her archetype to do the impossible, see the invisible, row row, etc, etc? More importantly, in exceeding her own limits, she can inspire others to live up to their potential and do the same. Already, she, along with Pipe, who I die and also kill for, has made a profound impact on Kaburagi, putting the fight back in an old man who was all but ready to give up for good. He's acting in direct defiance of his role simply by choosing to train and protect her, and in keeping with the lightning-fast pacing of Decadence's narrative escalation, he was already on the verge of spilling the beans to her by episode 4. 
He goes even further in Episode 5, during a fight that is the best of the series, season, and year so far, and also all but guaranteed to be surpassed in an episode or two because the show's that good. If the OP is any indication, then it looks like he'll be taking the fight to Solid Quake before too long, and I've got a strong feeling that he's just the first of many who will follow Natsume's lead. The reason that Kabaragi's boss, Rubik's Cube Dio, is so insistent that the world must be free of bugs is that bugs tend to have a knock-on effect, one that only becomes more pronounced the more precisely the system to which they're introduced is engineered. Individual aberrations aren't much of a threat on their own, but no system of control can survive when the collective that comprises it begins acting in its own interest. There are a lot of interesting philosophical and political ideas at play in both of this series' worlds, and the way that those wildly different worlds are at once impossibly distant from and inseparably connected to one another adds another layer to that. Rebuking not just the notion that people should serve governing systems rather than the other way around, but the neo-colonial delusion that we can somehow separate ourselves from the people we exploit. These ideas are presented in a manner that's both subtly nuanced and incredibly on the nose. I mean, the show's named for a giant walking fortress that houses all of humanity while channeling their collective work and willpower into a single massive fist. That is some radical symbolism, the power of which Decadence explicitly calls attention to, but perhaps more importantly, it's just plain rad. A lot of what I said in my video about No Gun's Life, which is back this season by the way, also applies here. Though I wouldn't call anything about Decadence dumb, not in the same way as Gun Dad anyway, it definitely puts the cool fun of its concept and especially its combat ahead of everything else, looking to thrill viewers and get them invested in its worlds and characters before it worries about delivering any deeper messages. I've compared this series to a lot of different anime in the last 15 some odd minutes, but in this it reminds me most strongly of Tengen Tapa Gurren Lagann. Yuzuru Tachikawa's directing style and aesthetic sensibilities are obviously very different from those of Hiroyuki Imaishi, yet the shows have a very similar energy about them in their rapid pacing, kinetic sakuga packed action, fluid expressive character animation, spectacularly creative creature designs, willing willingness to embrace and toy with tropes, and, of course, their strict deference to the rule of cool. Also, Pipe is one of the only anime mascots on the same level as Buta, and Kuranai is a Yoko tier waifu, so there's that. There aren't many anime that can make me feel the way Gurren does, not even Imaishi's other work, though all of his productions have their own unique qualities to recommend them by, but Decadence really hits that mark while carving out its own distinctive identity. And given that said identity is heavily tied to a decaying industrial aesthetic and Attack on Titan inspired mode of action that speaks straight to my steampunk dweeb soul, this may even end up topping Tengen Tapa and a lot of other anime on my all time faves list. It also may not. The tricky thing about original anime is that there's no roadmap to let us know where we'll end up with them. But I'm loving the ride so far, and it's exciting not knowing where it's going next, especially when it had me thinking I had it all figured out in episode one. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.